So we've got to talk about the lost cause, the lost cause myth. Now, I posted a video about this the other night, but I wasn't happy with it. And that happens sometimes when you post something here on YouTube. Either the video is too long, you forget to put something in the video. Maybe you didn't have your vitamins that day. Maybe you're in a bad mood. Who knows? So I decided to go back and redo the video. And I'm glad I did because it allowed me to step back, look at this argument with a new perspective, watch different videos here on YouTube, look at what people are saying online. And I got to tell you, folks, the misinformation that's out there, it's just incredible that these people don't even know their own history. And if you believe in the 1619 Project or the 1776 Project, and let's face it, if you believe in the 1619 Project, you're probably a Democrat. If you believe in the 1776 Project, you're probably a Republican. And y'all talk about racial, social, and economic equality. Well, that's not why the United States was founded. Let me ask you a question. Speaking of the lost cause. Was the American Revolution, was that a lost cause? Because all 13 colonies practiced slavery. That King George promised to free the slaves in New England if they left the rebel masters. And you had thousands of slaves who fought for the Americans and the British during their freedom. In 1780, Vermont became the first state to abolish slavery, but that was through a process of gradual emancipation. So, generally speaking, it wasn't the living slave that was freed. It was their offspring after so many years of service. New York passed its uh, abolition in 1799, abolition laws. But they had a stipulation in the law, I mentioned this before, that allowed plantation owners, slave owners, to live up to nine months in the state of New York with their slaves. This all led to Lemon versus New York because there was a conflict with that just before the Civil War. And they were trying to appeal this case, but because of the Civil War, it never got heard. But it just amazes me the amount of misinformation that's out there. So I don't want to go too far in the weeds, but we've got to look at, if you really want to know what happened in, let's say, 1776 or in 1860, 1861, You've got to go back to the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, Articles of Confederation, the secession documents, the CSA Constitution. And don't you just love these people? I've noticed this. Maybe I'm the only one here, but I've noticed this. Don't you just love these people? Like, they'll have a podcast here on YouTube. And it's usually somebody in a room somewhere in California doing a Zoom call, and the sound quality is not that great. Or somebody in Iowa. So they got somebody in California, somebody in Iowa, somebody in New York, somebody in, let's say, Atlanta. And they all agree on the same thing. It was a lost cause. The South seceded just to preserve slavery and Jim Crow. Well, we'd have to say the American Revolution. As I mentioned, the American Revolution lost cause because all 13 colonies practiced slavery. And they didn't start past what Vermont did in 1780 during the American Revolution, which ended in 1783. But a lot of these states didn't pass their abolition laws until after the signing of the Constitution in 1787. As I mentioned, New York, 1799. But you go back and you read these documents and you realize it all clicks that it was about state sovereignty, no matter what the issue was. Didn't matter if it was slavery or taxes, commerce, disputes over waterways, whatever the issue was, it was all about state sovereignty, limiting the power of the central government. And these colonists, they wanted to guarantee the rights that they were, these rights, they were uh, guaranteed under the ancient constitutions, what they call the ancient constitutions, rights guaranteed by parliament, which they felt the king was violating. That's what it was about. It was about political equality, not social, economic, or racial equality. It was about political equality. So welcome back to the channel, Culture Confederacy here. It's Friday. Happy Friday, everybody. And thank you for watching, subscribing, being a part of this thing called the Culture Confederacy. 
So what we do here, if you're new to the channel, it's all about history, culture, preservation, maybe a tinge of politics. We celebrate great art, music, history, as I mentioned. So if you go to South Carolina's secession document, and going back and researching this stuff, you had a lot of instances of racial disparity, racial inequality in, let's say, the 1930s, 1940s, during World War II. The armed forces were segregated before 1948. California, 1931, passed a law banning marriage between Asians and whites. 1890, San Francisco passed an ordinance requiring all of its Chinese citizens to move to another part of the city within six months. And if they didn't do so, they would be imprisoned, fined. In California, segregated its schools. They didn't allow the Mongolians, so the Chinese, Mongolians, Indians, Negroes, in public schools. Post-Civil War, during the Reconstruction period. This happened in California, not in the South. And Boston was segregating its schools back in the 1840s. But somehow the South is engaged in a lost myth. But I, I just love these people who have this attitude when they get, uh, you know, uh, together for these podcasts. And they always sound like this. Yeah, that's a, a really good question. Yeah, it was, it was, you know, really all about white supremacy. And it's just, it's fed into this, this uh, white nationalist movement. And it was so sad and tragic what happened at the AME uh, Amanda AME Church in South Carolina with Dylan Roof, who, uh, look at this picture, he's holding a Confederate battle flag. Yes, what happened at the Emanuel AME Church shouldn't have happened. But that was carried out by a lone wolf who decided to follow his own path. Had nothing to do with the Confederacy. Confederacy's been dead and gone for God knows how many years, 150, 160 years. Kevin Levine. Another example, Kevin Levine doing another one of these podcasts, trying to promote his book in search of black Confederates, trying to show that there weren't black Confederates or, you know, they were subservient in the Confederate army. They were just cooks or, you know, assistants or whatever the case may be. But I have it in my notes here, and this was according to a study done by Larry Coger back in 1985. Have right here that you had over a thousand free blacks who volunteered for Louisiana in the Civil War, known as the First Louisiana Native Guard. And according to a study here, it was not uncommon for freed blacks to become slave owners. That's what happened back in the day. People didn't necessarily work nine to five. By 1850, over 80% of black slaveholders were a mixed race, but nearly 90% of their slaves were classified as black. But that's really not correct because a lot of these people that were quote unquote African actually came from different parts of India. Uh, let's say uh, maybe Papua New Guinea. So they came from different parts of, of the world. A lot of people came over here as indentured servants. They were looking for work. So as part of their contract for immigration to the United States, paying off the cost of their trip, they might end up working on the plantation. It happened all the time. You had the Irish working for Native American slave owners. You had mixed slave owners, Native American slave owners. You had uh, black slave owners that were trying to buy slaves to free them because they were family members. So this is according to this guy's research back in 1985. But let's get to South Carolina secession document here. I'm trying to throw as much as I can in one video. And if you look at the Declaration of Independence and the South uh, Carolina Secession document, you see similar language. So, South Carolina Secession document. And now the state of South Carolina, having resumed her separate and equal place among nations, deems it due to herself, to the remaining United States of America, and to the nations of the world, that she should declare the immediate causes which have led to this act. You go to the Declaration of Independence. When in the course of human events, this is the first paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, which everybody misses. See, everybody believes that this document, the Declaration of Independence, is all about racial equality, social, economic equality. That's not what this is talking about. 
This is a secession document. It says it right here. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. It's the similar language we see here in South Carolina's secession document. And South Carolina's secession document goes on to talk about the Declaration of Independence, that these colonies declare that they are free and ought to be, or they are, are and of right ought to be free and independent states, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all their acts and things which independent states may of right do, no matter what the issue is, whether it's slavery, commerce, And they say here, go further into the document. They say, on the 23rd of May, 1788, South Carolina, by a convention of her people, passed an ordinance assenting to this constitution and afterwards altered her own constitution to conform herself to the obligations that she had undertaken. So they admit here, we have this issue about slavery or commerce or whatever the issue was. And we signed on to the constitution. By the way, one of the last states to do that was New York. They were very reluctant. One of the reasons for the Federalist Papers, they were very reluctant to sign onto the Constitution. New York was. So they admit here that they, that South Carolina, through a convention, passed an ordinance, signing, uh, deciding to sign onto the Constitution, and they altered their own state constitution or local constitution to conform to the obligations that she had undertaken. But this is key here. Thus was established by compact between the states a government with definite objects and powers limited the express words of the grant. This limitation left the whole remaining mass of power subject to the clause, reserving it to the states or to the people, rendering unnecessary any specifications of reserved rights. Talking about the Tenth Amendment. So right here, they all understood that any state at any time could leave this thing called the United States, which was actually a confederation. If you go to the Articles of Confederation, Article 1, the style of this confederacy shall be the United States of America. Each state, this is Article 2, each state retains its sovereignty, freedom, and independence, and every power, jurisdiction, and right, which is not by this confederation expressly delegated to the United States in Congress assembled. Article 3 says that they have entered into a firm league of friendship with each other for their common defense, the security of their liberties, and their mutual and general welfare. To better, Article 4, to better to secure and uh, perpetuate mutual friendship and intercourse among the people of the different states in this union, the free inhabitants of each state, paupers, vagabonds, and fugitives from justice accepted, which would mean anybody who committed a violent crime, runaway slaves, it's all in here. Articles of Confederation. If you go to the CSA Constitution, here's the preamble of the CSA Constitution. We, the people of the Confederate States, each state acting in its sovereign and independent character, in order to form a permanent federal government, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, invoking the favor and guidance of Almighty God, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the Confederate States of America. But wait, I thought this was all about slavery. And all the language is the same here. States are supposed to be sovereign and independent. The Constitution is a compact. And the Constitution does not prohibit secession. All 13 colonies during the American Revolution practiced slavery. Slavery was still legally recognized under the U.S. Constitution from 1860, uh, 1861 to 1865 during the Civil War. New Jersey did not end uh, slavery, abolish it until January of 1866. But some other examples. For those of you who believe that the South was disengaged in this lost cause. It's all led to white nationalism. Well, what about in 1934? 1934. Have it right here. 1934. You had these loans, these uh, affordable loans that uh, were being handed out. But guess what? Blacks were excluded from that. 1934. As I mentioned, 1931. Banning marriage between Asians and whites. 1974, violent busing riots in Boston. 
like 72 to 74, 75, somewhere around there. You had Japanese, Germans, Italians who were interned in the U.S. during World War II. How many people know that? Italians and Germans, white people interned in camps in the United States during World War II. So who's promoting a lost cause here? Who's promoting a lost cause? So thank you for being with me. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, you know what to do. You can also follow me at Instagram, hashtag Jason Composes, because I write music in my spare time. Or you can find me at X, Culture Confederacy, at Culture Confed 1 on X. This is the Culture Confederacy saying peace out. Stay safe, everybody. God bless this thing called the United States. And you know how we do it here. This is where the past crashes with the present. I'll catch you next time. And you all have a great Friday.